right, so um, welcome and thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to join us in the training. And before we get started, um, we just said, you know, make sure you put your questions in the chat box. It's not really a question box. And if you've got any questions, you know, as we're talking, as we're going through the content, put them in the box and we'll come back to them at the end. But make sure they're specific so that we know what the question's about. You know, so if we're talking about something specific and you've got a question, say about, I don't know, the move, movable alphabet, mention that in the, uh, the question so we, we know what you're talking about when it comes to answering the questions at the end. It's a bit difficult to try and field the questions and go through the slides at the same time, which is why we do the questions at the end. Right, so if you can tell us whereabouts in the world you are, um, and we'll start getting going. So we've got a quick quiz. How many years do you think myself and Deb have been teaching Montessori? So hazard a guess, put it in the chat box and we'll see what you think. I think this is a bit difficult because Deb looks far long, younger than she actually is on her photos. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the um, questions are coming, the comments are coming through a bit slow, so if we move on, we can come back to that. Right, so today we're going to show you how you can be confident in applying Montessori methods at home, and that it's not going to take you 12 months to do so, you can do it in 27 days or a month or less. Um, and we know that a lot of people want to do the Montessori training. You know, that takes a long time, which is why we do the crash course. So we're going to destroy the biggest misconceptions people have about using Montessori and the misconceptions that are stopping them from achieving the results that they want for their child. There's a lot of things you can be doing at home easily with the equipment and things that you've already got in your home. So we believe that the secret to having your child achieve his or greatest potential is by giving the very best Montessori foundations. Um, both Deb and I are big, big fans of Montessori. We've used it with our own family as well as, you know, doing training and being Montessori advocates. Very definitely. I've been in, in very much uh, Montessori lover for many, many years now. Don't want to give away that answer too much, though. <laughs> well, we haven't had anyone uh, reply yet. So. <laughs> okay. Um, next slide. Yeah. Um, we'll be giving you some practical steps so you can get started straight away. You know, hopefully after the, the webinar, make sure you've got a pen and paper. Um, you can actually start doing some of the things today with your child. And for those who want to know more, we'll tell you about Montessori Crash Course too. So yeah, make sure you've got a pen and paper so you can make some notes as we go through everything. So give me a big yes in the chat box if you would like to apply Montessori in your home in 27 days or less, and you're passionate about giving your child the very best foundations for a fulfilling and successful life. I think really, Everybody wants to do that, you know, it's... Yeah, I think so. <laughs> it's like a mothering instinct, isn't it? Or right. parents in general. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've had an answer. Uh, Brandy thinks we've been doing Montessori for 28 years combined. Oh. <laughs> Miles off. <laughs> And a big yes to uh, wanting to use Montessori. That's yeah. right. I can give them a hand. I think I started um, in Montessori in 1975. Wow. Wow, I was only four. <laughs> <laughs> so my son is, mine's easy to work out because my son is 10 and a half coming up 11 and I discovered Montessori when I was pregnant with him so kind of 11 years for me. <laughs> so 
56 years between us. I guess it's probably something like that, you know, for sure, at least, yeah. So it's definitely cheating because you look younger on your pictures. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a bit about me. Um, my name's Joe Ebisujima. I'm a Brit and I live in Japan. I've been here 15 years, 16 years. <clears throat> I'm a former ESL teacher to thousands of kids on three different continents. I'm the best-selling author of the Montessori Inspired Activities book, which grew from my blog. Um, I was where you are 10, 11 years ago. You know, I was just finding out about Montessori. I fell in love with the whole concept and wanted to start applying it straight away. And I got kind of bogged down and overwhelmed with, for me, it was lack of information. And these days, it's the other way around. There's so much information out there. And I was just desperate to learn more about it. But I had limited time and limited funds. And where I live in Japan, we didn't have any Montessori schools. So it meant I was going to have to do it all at home. Um, so since my son has been born, we've been raising him bilingual and in the Montessori way. And I taught at a Montessori school, which we just did it at the weekends um, for the bilingual kids. It was for the bilingual playgroup. But unfortunately, it closed due to the earthquake in March five years ago um, because it was in a radiation hot spot, which was a bit sad. But it was very sad. So that's yeah. about me. How about you, Deb? <clears throat> hey, um, I actually got involved in Montessori, as I said, probably about 1975. I was a daycare teacher at the time. And I was a bit frustrated because it, the environment always seemed a bit chaotic and a bit noisier than I'd like. There was so much time spent directing the children. And then I met a lovely four-year-old girl who started coming to the daycare center. It just amazed me at her level of focus. And she was, she was just amazing and, and really stood out. And I talked to her mother and I found out that her mother was a trained American Association Montessori International teacher, although she had switched careers at that point. But she had raised her daughter Montessori and she to kind of took me under her wing and gave me Montessori books to read and, and her showed me her albums and gave me ideas. And so I started a makeshift Montessori school at that time. and. It was, it, I mean, it was just in my daycare classroom and I had no budget other than our, our regular preschool toys. So we at least did have low shelves and I used hamburger trays for the, the trays and I made all the materials myself. And the amazing thing is that it actually worked. There were, there were tremendous results. I saw the children become more calm and focused and concentrated, they were happy they would work for long periods of time and it was just, it was amazing. So then from there I went on and got my Montessori certification and I was a Montessori teacher in the 1970s. In the 1980s I had my own Montessori school and then my son was born in 1985 and for a while I was directing and just teaching part time and then there was a Montessori teacher shortage and we were in South Dakota where it wasn't really a hot spot for teachers to want to go. And so I ended up having to teach and direct again totally and I felt that I was taking too much time away from my family. So I ended up closing my school and homeschooling my son and then my daughter was born in 1990 and so I homeschooled them totally with Montessori as preschoolers. And then when they were in elementary, we used a mixture of Montessori and unit studies because there weren't Montessori materials available to do an entire elementary program at home at that point. But it worked really well to just add bits and pieces of Montessori. And I find many people still do that today. And we did that all the way through high school. Now my children have they have about they both have bachelor's degrees. I now have my master's degree from Sheffield Hallam University in England. It's 
in early childhood studies, which is, has always kind of been my favorite area, although obviously I've taught all levels. And I've also taught a religious-based Montessori program in a church and godly play. And um, now I'm a Montessori blogger and a Montessori grandmother. So my, uh, my Montessori career has come pretty much full circle, and I'm still having fun. Though I guess I'm in the second generation of having fun. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so why do we glory? Well, number one, it's child-led philosophy, not teacher-led. So the Montessori method follows each individual child's interests and the child studies at a greater depth and with more love and understanding if he or she is following a passion. And if you think about yourself, you do that as well. You know, if you pick up a book because you're interested in the subject matter, you're more likely to finish the book and follow it up with more reading or more learning. But if you're forced to read a book, maybe at work you've given something to read and it's not something you're passionate about, you find it much more difficult to take in the information. So this is different to regular school where the child much, must follow what the teacher decides to teach. You know, there's set curriculum and they have to go at a certain pace. At Montessori, um, they can go at their own pace, which is much better for the child as well. And, and there's no I, pressure. Sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say it's so nice that it works for gifted children and for children with special needs because because of the individualized aspect of it. Because I actually started out in special education in my bachelor's degree and then I switched to regular elementary education and I felt like I ended up doing a lot with gifted education later on too. And, and it all works in Montessori. Yeah much better than a uh, standard classroom where, you know, the ki the brighter kids or the gifted kids are kind of held back and the kids that need more help are not getting the help that they need. So Montessori really does benefit all the children in the classroom. <coughs> and the second reason is for the materials. So when learning about Montessori materials, there's a lot of logic and science behind their design. And they're designed to help the child explore and question things and to expand their inquisitive mind. So, you know, the kind of things that children do naturally. And again, this is unlike regular school where rote learning and workbooks have become the norm, which we now know is a problem. As many companies are reporting, it's difficult to recruit staff who can think outside the box and who are good problem solvers. And it's even got to the point where um, recent reports in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of people turning to homeschooling because they're not getting the out-of-the-box thinkers that they need in industry. <clears throat> and it also promotes a lifelong love of learning. So Montessori encourages children to fall in love with learning and to be inquisitive and curious. And it helps children to find out how things work, why things work in certain ways, certain things happen, and where things come from. So education isn't forced upon them. They, like they have to do it. It's done because um, they want to do it. And if they want to do it, they love it, and they'll carry this passion with them through life. And it's a well-documented fact that the most successful people in life uh, li lifelong learners. I know. I really found that with my children is that um, they became both became entrepreneurs, and I think it was so much of their being allowed to follow their interests, and they still love to learn it. And even today, I'll see them, you know, get into something new that they're interested in, and it's so much fun to watch the whole process. And another thing I notice is that my kids were never bored. And they still aren't. Yeah. And I think that's from following their interests, that they don't feel that that they're forced to do things as much, even though there's some things that everybody has to do that we're not crazy about. We still always have things that we're excited to do when we have the chance to do them. Yes, yes. 
So there's a lot of successful Montessori graduates out there. Um, the Google founders, Larry Page and Sergi Brin. Amazon's Jeff Bezos. <coughs> Excuse me. Wikipedia founder, Jimmy Wales. Uh, Helen Keller, Jan and Frank. The chef, Julia Child. Prince Harry and Prince William. And of course, the new Prince George. He's just started Montessori school this last September. And the rapper, Sean P. Diddy, who's, they were all Montessori educated. And a lot of them um, say that their Montessori education is part of their success. And Larry Page said when he was talking about Montessori and how it contributed to his success is that, I think it is part of the training of not following rules and orders and being self-motivated questioning what's going on in the world and doing things a little bit differently. Okay, why did we put this workshop together? And part of the reason we did is because there's so much information out there. It, it's absolutely overwhelming for everyone. The, the you know, information overload is a common problem for everybody. And so in the... <clears throat> So what we often do is kind of help parents figure out where, where they should focus. What do they specifically need to work on for their child? And then also those who are new to Montessori often don't feel confident about it. You know, am I doing things right? Parents fall into the trap of comparing their home to a Montessori classroom, which you really don't need to do that at all. And sometimes parents try to use Montessori, but the activities flop and they're not sure why. And then parents may not sure, no, be sure how to set up their home in the best way for their child. Okay, and another problem a lot of people have is money and time. I mean, because if you've looked at Montessori training courses, you know that most courses will take at least a year and a good amount of money. And you know, if you're a parent and not planning to be a Montessori teacher, then you could miss the window of opportunity there are sensitive periods that your child will have, that there's a certain time that they'll be focused on something that they won't be later on. So, you know, you could miss that if, if you're doing training just because you feel that you need to do that. So if you agree that this is a problem for you, you can let us know in the chat box. So our mission isn't to help child, children pass tests, but for the child to pass a lifelong, to develop a lifelong love of learning. And, and that was the thing I found so much in, in my homeschooling too for my children. We didn't have tests and we didn't use grades and they did develop a lifelong love of learning. And that was my, that was the best thing, even though they were successful, the fact that they still love to learn is, is the most important. Today we will cover the difference between the Montessori home and Montessori classroom, how you can get started today without specialized equipment, and fundamental philosophies that Montessori education is built on. And we're going to tell you a secret that will make everything else fall into place. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Problem one. Can you have an authentic Montessori environment at home and can you afford it? So Montessori schools are great, but generally they're very expensive. And Montessori teacher training will take you a year and quite a lot of money. So Deb, can you talk to us about the difference between having a Montessori home and a Montessori school? Certainly. Um, the Montessori home, generally you aren't going to have the space that will be available in a Montessori classroom and that's fine. Even if you have just one shelf, you really can do it. You'll just have to rotate materials a lot more often. But you need to remember that a classroom can have up to 25 children. children. So you need the activities that your children need. You don't need the activities that a whole classroom will need. And that's why it's important to realize that you don't need to spend the money 
developing a whole Montessori classroom. You really just need, um, actually, I you know since I had my Montessori school, when I closed it, I kept most of the materials and I used them for our Montessori homeschool, but I found that I didn't need most of the materials because my children had specific interests and certain things they, they went through really quickly. For example, the color tablets. I, typ I typically wouldn't buy those for a home school because children, a lot of children learn the colors very quickly. And there are actually printables that you can use to make your own versions of color tablets, you know, so that will save a lot of money. And if your children happen to soar through that, then you're not having these extra materials that you really don't need to have around. And also Montessori is as much about the theory as it is the equipment. So if you understand the theory, then you can often you can often duplicate the same results without having to buy all of the specialized equipment. That's something I wish I'd known when I started because I didn't realize that, you know, um, and I thought I needed all the proper equipment. And it wasn't until a couple of years in, and I happened to have a really good mentor who was saying, oh, you don't need to buy that. You could just do it by doing this kind of thing. But that made a big difference for me because you know I didn't have the money and having to buy things and have them shipped to Japan as well because I couldn't buy them in the in Japan meant I had to be very savvy about the equipment I did buy. Right, you would have to. And and I think most people just even if they have unlimited funds, they just don't have the amount of space in their homes to have a have a full classroom. And so you really do need to be careful about what you want to buy for your home. And also, if you're, if you're using Montessori at home to support your child in a Montessori school, you don't even want to duplicate it because they won't use the materials at school in the same way. So generally, if your child is in a Montessori school, you're best to not have Montessori materials, but to have materials that will just be ways to extend what they're doing at school things that will help them with their concentration and with their practical life abilities, but that won't actually be Montessori materials. Another thing you can do is many materials can be made inexpensively. Um, and um, many toys and educational materials can be used as a substitute. There are many of the same concepts that you can learn, even with certain nesting toys that will, will be, can be used for many children. Like I had a post just recently about how the Russian nesting dolls can be used to teach bigger and smaller and opening and closing and, and they can be used for a lot of different things. So there are many activities. Legos can be used for lots of educational activities. Different sorts of blocks and, and building materials can be used. So it really depends on what exactly your purpose is with doing Montessori at home. And if you do want to have a Montessori homeschool, then you will want to have the materials that your child needs, the Montessori materials. But otherwise, you have a lot of flexibility. And even as a Montessori homeschooler, there are many materials you can make. I have a series of posts with do-it-yourself Montessori materials. And here's an example of the movable alphabet. It's usually made up of red and blue letters. The blue, the vowels are blue and the, and the consonants are red. But you can buy magnetic letters. They're ones that they actually haven't found any that are have blue vowels and red consonants, but there are magnetic letters. I actually have some that have red vowels and blue consonants that, that can be purchased on Amazon. And you know, those can work as a movable alphabet. I've started making printables um, at Living Montessori now. You can find printables in a variety of themes. Right now, it's a subscriber freebie. I have one. It's for my newsletter subscribers. But I have frog movable alphabets that you can use. Just print them out, and they can work like a movable alphabet. Now I have butterfly movable alphabet. And so they just need to be printed and cut out, laminated, if you wish. But there are a lot you can do. You can buy wooden craft letters and paint them yourselves. You can paint letters on rocks. People have done that before for movable alphabets. A lot of things like stuffed animals can be used for all sorts of sorting activities. My granddaughter has had lots of activities with beanie babies that I had from when my children were younger. 
<coughs> what you really need to focus on is learning to observe your child and see what your child needs right at the moment. And so if your child needs extra work in a specific area, then that's an area you might want to have more materials in or to make more materials in. And if, it's, if a concept is mastered easily, you really don't want to have a lot of materials in that area because they'll end up not being used. And you want to use your whole home as a classroom, not just one specific area. You can, if you're a homeschooler, you obviously might have a, a homeschool classroom, but you will want to have your whole home set up Montessori friendly so that your kitchen is accessible to your child and the dining room and, and that basically the whole home is is a welcome area for your child. And then you need to think about the amount of Montessori work you'll be doing and the reason why. You know, will you be going all out in homeschooling? Will you be using it for after school activities? Supporting a child who's in Montessori school. It's, again, it's about, it's, as I said before, if you're supporting a child who's in a Montessori school, you probably don't want actual Montessori materials. Or do you have a baby and you're just starting out, which that is super fun. Yeah, I was just going to say with the materials that um, things like the practical life in a classroom, you have a lot of the practical life materials out on the shelf. But in the home, often the practical life is part of life, you know, folding socks or putting, you know, like folding napkins or whatever and putting them away. It's part of the daily routine. It doesn't need to be shelf work. And I think that is something that's a big difference between the classroom and the home as well. That's right. Okay, problem two. How can you get started today without specialised equipment and a full year of training? So what can our listeners do today, straight after the call, to get going with Montessori? Okay, so one of the first things you can do is get rid of your toy box. You know, you, may, you can keep it if you want, but just use it in your closet for storage. You want to have low shelves. In that photo, that's my granddaughter Zoe at age 10 months. And you'll see that all her, her materials were in baskets, and then we had baskets and trays on low shelves. I had her books forward facing on a shelf because that made them more accessible for her and more appealing. And what you'll do is you'll reduce the amount of toys on your shelf so your child doesn't get overwhelmed. That's a real important concept, especially if you have a limited space, you want to use rotation a lot. Baskets or trays on the shelves are good for organizing many toys and educational materials. And you'll want to keep your home as orderly and attractive as possible. And that's so important because it actually helps your child organize his or her mind. And so it's, it's important not just for a beautiful environment, but actually for brain development. So what you want to do is to get started is to set up your home to allow as much freedom as possible. And my granddaughter is two years and four months right now, and I watch her a few afternoons each week. And so ever since she was a baby, I've had my, I have a living room, dining room, and kitchen that are all connected, and she has always had access to that whole area. And so what I did was I baby-proofed the whole area and then just allowed her to use you know, to have freedom of movement in it. And it was very helpful that she learned to walk early and she's <clears throat> has always been very athletic. And and it just was, I think it very much helped that she never had a playpen. She and at her home too, she had the same thing where they just gated off the areas that were unsafe. Like I have my had my stairways gated off at her home. She actually in, in their upstairs, they had the stairway gated, but she had freedom to go from her room to her parents' room and in the hallway between that. And then she had the whole main floor again where she had freedom to move around. So you just need to think about how your home can meet your child's needs for movement and independence. And get down to your child level and look around. What might be dangerous? What can you change? This was actually the how my home set up around a baby. In the photo before, it was more as a toddler. We always had a child-style floor bed for her naps. 
And it's even changed a bit now. She doesn't always nap at my place. So I have now her, the futon now is down in my office and she can sleep down there if she needs to take a nap. But before we had the futon here and when she, when she could just, when she was just a very tiny baby and before she could actually go to the shelves, then I just kept a couple of baskets of toys right by her bed. And she always had a horizontal mirror. Now it's a vertical mirror. But for babies, it's really helpful if they have a horizontal mirror so that they can look look at themselves. And um, they real, um, that's something that's really nice for babies. It's kind of a classic Montessori material. So what you want to do is really, there are so many things you can do with practical life or daily living activities for both toddlers and preschoolers. It's important that you don't expect your child to know how to do something. Show your child how to do the activity, whatever it is. If it's how to water a plant, show them exactly how to water it. How to clean granddaughter at 16 months cleaning windows. Setting a table, caring for a pet. They really can start so many of these activities. Some even as babies, others as toddlers. They can fold laundry, clean the table, sweep the floor, wash vegetables, prepare snacks. We have a lot in the Montessori crash course about having a snack preparation area, and they can they can do that at an amazingly young age. And you show your child step by step how to do an activity. Um, you'll want to use as few words as possible so your child can concentrate on the actions. We just recently I have a Living Montessori Now YouTube channel that is mainly run by my daughter, who's now almost 26 and was a Montessori child. And she often will show activities, how, show how to do a Montessori activity. We recently had one on showing a child how to take care of a book. And it's, very, it's a very, very specific process where you gently, very, very slowly and gently open the book using your thumb. and and then sliding your hand down the book page. And it's a very, it's a very specific process. You might think it's a little exaggerated, but it really helps children learn how to take care of books. And if you saw the books that I have that my children had, because I saved our favorite ones, and they, they actually look like new, because I taught my children how to turn the pages, how to open a book, how to turn the pages of a book, how to close a book very gently when they were toddlers. So what you do is you'll, you'll show a specific task, each step of it, and then you'll let your child have a turn. And then if you need to show it again, you can show it many times until your child masters the skill that you're trying to show. And daughter at two years, but the rice wasn't quite going in the container. And there, on the right, she <laughs> was was able to more perfectly pour with the water, but she's better at it by now. So if you just you know allow them to have time to keep practicing and practicing, and they really it's amazing how quickly they'll progress. Now, this is something for a homeschool that's interesting. I never had sensory bins. That's not really something that you usually see in a Montessori school because Montessori materials usually isolate each specific task. Like you'll have a task, it's just for pouring. Whereas like a sensory bin, you'll have pouring and you might have all sorts of activities, but it's wonderful for, for home. So this is something that you can have and you can switch throughout the year and you really, I have a do-it-yourself sensory table. If you go on Living Montessori Now blog, you can find out how to make one. But you can do it just with one of those under-the-bed storage containers and then putting in different, uh, different materials like this. This colored rice is the background here for Valentine's Day. But my granddaughter had so much fun. A lot of it was for she had a scavenger hunt. So you could put math activities, you could put language activities, you could put all sorts of different activities that take almost no money to put together. And my granddaughter spends hours 
with her sensory bin. She absolutely loves it. And, you know, I think they're wonderful. It's something I would not be without now. You know, if I were raising my children again, I would definitely have sensory bins. So it's exciting that I can do that for my grandchildren. But I wouldn't have known, you know, just as a Montessori teacher, just how special they are for home use. And so try to avoid worksheets, use manipulatives. I love printables, but the printables I use aren't worksheets. They're, they're printables that you can use for hands-on activities. You'll find a lot of those on my blog. I make some. And well, my daughter and I now make some together, too. And then often I just have links to them where you can download them for free or, or for a low cost. And there are just so many activities you can do for the, the, with those just with materials around your house. And then often you just need to think about what's being taught. Look for objects in your house or your yard that will teach that concept. You know, your child can count spoons while taking them out of the dishwasher. Your child might want to count the napkins they're putting on the table. How many forks do, need, do they need to put out? They can, older children can add, they can add Legos, they can add beans, they can add whatever. This is this picture. This is my granddaughter with one of her favorite activities. She's always loved rocks. So she loves to kind of just, if we go on a walk, she'll line up rocks, but then we'll count them. And it's a, it's a great math activity and the price is right. <laughs> Here is a top tip. This is so important. Don't interrupt your child when he or she is concentrating on something. And this is something that's, Difficult to do at first, you really have to stand back and realize, oh, I need to not do this. Because when your child is concentrating and really focusing on something, you want to say, oh my gosh, that's so good. I can't believe you're doing that. Oh, that's great. But if you don't interrupt, you're going to help your child improve the ability to concentrate. So what you want to do is just not say anything until your child is it has stopped, is done with the, with the work that he or she is doing, and is is ready to go on to something else. And you can say, oh, wow, you worked so long. I thought you were really working hard. And what we usually do in Montessori, we'll focus on how hard they worked rather than how, how great something was. So we'll, we'll just focus on what, how hard they worked at that. This is kiddies and activities. So one of the big problems that both Deb and I see with um, our readers and clients is that mom, moms get caught up with the activities, or you know, as Montessori calls it, work, without getting a good grounding and the philosophy behind the activity first. So you see something great on uh, Pinterest. You know, Pinterest is a black hole of <laughs> activities to get sucked into. <laughs> That's for sure. And you try it out with your child, but it falls flat, and you don't understand why. And this is usually because you're applying the activity without the theory. So, Deb, can you share the basics so our listeners can get started, you know, with a bit more confidence? Okay, and as we said, just take the first step, just get started. We, can, we can't go really deep into anything today, but you know that's we cover a lot more in the Montessori crash course, but understanding these steps will help you. Okay, the first step is help me to do it myself. And this is one of the most common principles Montessori is known for. I love this quote, these words reveal the child's inner needs, help me to do it alone, or never help a child with a task at which he feels he can succeed. And that's something that you'll want. If your child is wanting to do something, it's very important to just step back and let your child try it, even, even if it's going to not be perfect. And he, you, what you'll want to do is demonstrate how to do a task, break the task down into distinct steps, find points of interest. You know, for example, with the, with the um, turning of the page in the book, we'd find points of interest, you know, that if you're turning it very gently, there won't be any creases in the page. And that's a hard thing for a toddler to learn, but they can. Have a control of error, a way of pro providing instant feedback. And many of the Montessori materials have a built-in control of error, which is wonderful. For example, there are numbers and counters, and you'll have the numbers 1 to 10, and then you'll have exactly 55 counters. So 
if they've counted, they've matched them all up, and if they end up with the wrong number, then that's, then they know there's something wrong, so they can tell instantly. And then whatever it is, let your child practice the task. Sensitive periods are another very important part of Montessori. They are so helpful for parents. Maria Montessori said that the inner sensibilities we have mentioned determine the selection of necessary things from a many faceted environment and of circumstances favorable to development. The guidance is exercised by making the child sensitive only toward certain things, leaving him indifferent toward others. When he is sensible of something, it's as if a light came from him, illuminating that and no other, and of such things his world is made. And it really is like a light. It's it's like the only thing they want to do is, you know, maybe they're just lining things up and it's their sense of their need for order. Maybe they are just focused on small details because there's a sensitive period for small objects and details. And, and we often use in Montessori small objects when they're learning phonetic sounds because they find them so much fun. And my grand, well, my kids and my granddaughter learned, um, they focus on phonetic sounds through the small objects because they just love them. And that's just part of the sensitive periods. But there's a sensitive period for reading, a sensitive period for writing. And if you're aware of those things, even though they vary from child to child, there are certain guidelines. And those will make it give you, your child a time that will be natural to learn something rather than doing it at a, at a time that isn't optimal. So the sensitive periods, as we said, are there are blocks of time when a child is almost exclusively absorbed with one characteristic of the environment. And when it's at its height, your child will appear to be obsessed with an activity, repeating it over and over. If you see that, that's good. Don't worry about your child repeating an activity. Obsession at that age is a good thing. The repetition is actually a sign that your child's fulfilling an important need in his or her development. So usually what children will do is they'll repeat an activity over and over and over and over, and then all of a sudden they'll stop because they met that need for doing that need need in their development, and then they'll move on to something else. So for you as a parent, what you'll need to do is watch your child observing is so important in Montessori, and what you'll do as a parent is that you'll be watching for the right activity to introduce it at the right time in your child's development. And control of error, as I said, that gives a child instant feedback or a way to check his or her own work. The traditional Montessori materials have a built-in control of error. Um, for example, the pink tower, the cubes are exactly designed, so if they get them in order, they'll be largest to smallest with the very, very exact measurements. And if something's out of place, they can easily see it. But you know, if they don't see it right away, they'll you don't have to correct it. Typically, they'll they'll come to it on their own. With if you're doing do-it-yourself Montessori materials or alternatives, that's where you'll need to think about whether you built in a control of error. And having a control of error is really nice because it, your child will learn to analyze and solve problems that they don't have to have an an adult coming and saying, oh, that's right or that's not right. So they learn to depend on themselves. Here was, as I said, that um, cards and counters, you'll exactly have 55. There are too many at the end. That means that the child made a mistake. Or like if on some activities, there'll be matching stickers on the back or like on smelling bottles, I'm matching stickers on the bottom so they can turn them over and see if they've matched them correctly. Many of the cards will have that control of error. And the, the secret that we talked about earlier, and this is so important to make everything else fall in its place, and the key for all this work is to follow the child. And if you follow the child, that will work at any age of child. It works for adults, too. I still use that with my adult children if they're wondering about something. I'll check that it's that they're following their interests, that they're following their talents. That's something that my children, even though they're Montessori children and we didn't have grades or tests, my children both became competitive figure skaters because that's what they wanted to do. And they ended up becoming elite figure skaters and then competed internationally. 
but that was because it came from them. It didn't come from, that wasn't something that we said, oh, you really need to do this. And so if you individualize learning for your unique child's needs and interests, then they'll end up doing, you know, what's right for them. Like even my children's figure skating led to their adult careers and it was just fascinating to watch how following interest, just one thing would lead to another in a perfect way. So as I said before, just observe your child to see what your child's needs and interests are and respect those needs and interests because your, your child really does have a sense of what's important. I think with the uh, follow the child as well is that providing them what they, they need so going back to Pinterest, you see all these great activities. If you're following the child and giving them the activities that they actually need, rather than the ones that you think look great, you can have more success. So if your child is really into letters and reading at the moment, then find activities that are going to you know, help them develop their reading skills or their phonics skills rather than trying to get them to do a pouring activity or a maths activity because you think they need maths. They will go through a period where they're interested in maths and numbers, but if what they're showing an interest in at the moment is letters and reading, then that's what you need to be providing them. And the same with things like if they get suddenly interested in dinosaurs or my son went through a, a stage of fascination with bats, so, you know, I made him some bat cards and we got books on bats and little model bats and he really dived into learning all about bats. So it's, <clears throat> and they can be learning maths while they're interested in bats. So we did like maths, um, you know, like counting activities or simple um, addition and subtraction using bats as the, the focus point. So by using um, things that they're actually really interested in, whether it be trains or cars or dinosaurs or fairies, it doesn't really matter, but you can give them activities that will help them as well by using that as the focus. Yeah, I know. That's why I love using unit studies because it works in that way, especially you can use a topic that they're specifically interested in at the moment. And, and here you can ask yourself, you know, these questions, what's capturing your child's imagination? That's something that you can use. When is your, when is your child playing? How is he or she playing? Sorting, counting, making stories, experimenting. What is your child doing? You know, really learn to watch your child and to see what your child is struggling with. And that's where, you know, like Joe said, if there's, if your child is in love, like my son was obsessed with vehicles. And so that would be a good thing to use to do different counting activities. If you're doing, counting, you know, do math with vehicles or, you know, whatever it is that, you know, use their interests to help them with an area they're struggling with. And as you start to answer these questions, you'll have a better idea of what you need to provide your child with. And the more you observe your child, the easier it gets and the more natural it gets where you don't really even have to give it second thought. Sometimes it's just kind of like, oh, you know, my child needs this. Like I know my granddaughter has been obsessed with beluga whales for over a year now. And so we've done a different number of different beluga whale activities. And, and it's been wonderful. We actually had our, her beluga whale. She had a special tray on her shelf for over a year. I finally, finally took that down. Although she still has her beluga whale in her special and she has a beanie baby wagon, her walker wagon that she had. So she's, she still has them available, but not in the same way. But I had to leave that on the shelf for so long because she was just definitely in love with them. But, you know, that was uh, a resource that could be used, you know, any sort of a love that your child has. So with your permission, we'd like to tell you a bit more about Montessori Crash Course. So we've touched on the key issues that stop many mamas from getting started, which are not knowing how the Montessori home and school differ and how to apply the theory in the home. Uncertainty about how to set up the home for your child in the Montessori way. Not being able to afford the equipment or not having the space. 
and not fully understanding the Montessori philosophy. So when you set up activities for your child, they flop or the child doesn't act as you expect him or her to. <clears throat> so what is stopping you from using Montessori principles and giving your child the very best foundation? So if you've got any specific problems or you know, you're resisting starting for some reason, share in the uh, chat box, in the question box, and we can help you work through that. So the big ones that we hear all the time is lack of time. So you want to get started quickly and you don't want to waste time on the stuff that you don't need. And we're not knocking year-long programs. There's definitely a place for them. But they're great if your long-term goal is to become a Montessori teacher. But for most moms, a year-long program, when you've got little ones underfoot, you need the information now. It, it just doesn't fit the bill. So you don't want something quick that you can get started with, that you can start doing today, so that you don't miss those perfect um, times and opportunities that your child is going to need you. <coughs> You know, so many mothers feel that their your children are only young once, and yeah. you think of how much time you'll have to spend studying, you know, unless that's really a goal of yours, that just might not be the time that you just might not want to take that time away from your family, too. Second thing is money. So, obviously, these long-term training programs are in-depth, and they take a big time commitment, but also a big financial one. And many of them cost hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. And we know that such a large financial commitment is hard. And we found that many of our mums are stay-at-home mums or they work part-time or they're, and or they're single mums. And you simply just don't have a spare couple of thousand dollars lying around. Or you might want to use that money to be buying equipment instead of the training. So we wanted to make Montessori Crash Course affordable for everyone. And the third thing is the information overload. So if you go onto Google and loads of Montessori stuff comes up, and you start reading and you're clicking links and you're taking notes and you add things to your Pinterest board. And before you know it, you've lost three hours, but you haven't got any tangible thing to show for it. And you're still really not sure how to get started or what's going wrong and why it's not working for you. So we wanted you to have all the information you need to get started bundled together in a digestible format so that you understand the why and you can totally get how to do it and how to implement it and get started quickly. And we kind of call it our hand-holding course because what we really do is, is if you have a question, like I, you know, if you're feeling overwhelmed about what you should be doing with your child, we'll ask you specific questions about what, what are your child's interests and and find out exactly what what your child could be what could be good for your child and then we'll direct you to the resources that will be good for you at that time so if you would like to use these concepts and integrated powerful Montessori methods into your home starting today let us know in the chat box you can see some big yeses coming through <clears throat> So the Montessori Crash Course is a 27-day hand-holding course. And it's everything that you need to apply Montessori in your home in record time and get started as soon as possible. Right. And you'll find out it's not just 27 days of hand-holding. No. <laughs> um, so there's four workshops. And the first one is the Montessori philosophy in a nutshell. This is what you need to know. And... This one, yeah. um, this one is where you'll discover how to present lessons and activities that your child will love. So your child is learning what he or she needs and when they need it. And your child will be motivated from within, which is really important, and allowing your child the freedom to learn about what he or she is interested in, like we talked about before. And that leads to a deeper understanding and a better level of self-motivation. 
And it also helps your child to become more independent, both physically and mentally, so that she is self-disciplined, passionate, responsible, empathetic, and happy, and able to communicate, contribute to the community. Yeah, and that's something I really found, you know, with my own children, is that by being Montessori children, as they became teenagers, like even with their homeschooling, they were able to do most of their schooling on their own, and they did become self-disciplined. I, Even as teenagers, my children didn't feel a need to rebel, and so I actually didn't have to discipline them. And, you know, there are so many things that they can learn if they're raised with Montessori from the time they're young. And you also understand how a child learns so you can provide the right activity at the right time. So there'll be no need to fight over drill books or anything like that. Your child will love what he or she is learning. And learn to teach the concrete ideas first so the abstract ones are grasped easily. So you'll have no more tears over long division or whatever that children usually uh, run into problems with. And you'll be able to support your child, giving your child what he or she needs when he or she needs it. So that cuts down on tantrums and bad behaviour. And you learn to support your child in the right way so that he or she can recognise something is wrong and how to handle it before it becomes an issue. And I really believe this is a skill that every child should learn. Right. And um, Ria Montessori believed that tantrums were from a need that was left unmet. And so you'll learn to, to really listen to your child and, and talk with your children so that you find out what the problems are so they can be dealt with right away and they don't become huge problems that are unmanageable down the road. It's funny that most of my friends have never seen my son throw a tantrum of any kind and they don't believe that he's ever thrown a tantrum. Yeah. You know, I'm a woman I'm learning as well so sometimes I didn't read the signs properly and we did have a few meltdowns but on a on a grand scale of things we've had very few tantrums really and I think it is down to the, the Montessori training that I had. Yeah it's amazing when children are used to being listened to and allowed to follow their interests they don't they just don't feel the need to act out in the same way. Mm. And finally, you'll help your child build character and learn how to take care of themselves, their environment and others. And learning skills such as helpfulness, respect, independence, responsibility and initiative. And these are important skills for the workplace and society, skills that will take with them as they grow into young adults and beyond. It's interesting, my um, daughter-in-law is a skating coach and also a sports psychology consultant, but as a skating coach, she always had talked to me about the Montessori kids. She had certain skaters for Montessori kids, and she said, I can always identify them because they're so respectful and they have good manners and they're, they're more independent, just that she could actually always identify them because of the traits that were in, which made them stand out from the other kids. So, uh, sorry, workshop two is the Montessori home, and this is the practicalities. So find out how to set up your home so it works for all your family members, making your life easier. Um, if you don't have a fully functional home, it can be detrimental to your child's development, preventing your child from learning the simplest of tasks, such as fixing a snack or cleaning up after themselves. And I'm, what, I'm sure... You want your child to eventually leave home capable of looking after him or herself. And you can discover how to put an end to your child constantly asking for help. Mommy, get me this. Mommy, I want that. If this is not dealt with, you'll end up raising a child who always looks to others for help, who lacks the courage to do things for him or herself. And simply discover um, and easily applied ways to help your child become more independent, which comes, cuts down on behaviour problems, like we talked about, and leads to better communication. And a child who actually listens to what you say 
and embrace how to set up your home so it works for your family. So this is not a one size fits all solution. Um, this is what your family needs and how you do it in your home because we've all got different homes, we've all got different needs and we've all got different families. Now, I think a lot of parents feel intimidated by Montessori teachers. There are some Montessorians are very strict about Montessori being followed in a very pure way. In your home, you can use Montessori however you want. And I really believe that's that's important. You might want to just use parts of it. You might need, want to use as much of the philosophy as possible, but it really is your choice. And workshop number three, Montessori activities, getting started. Now we did this one as number three because we believe that you need to have one and two in place before you start doing the activities. So you can stop feeling guilty because you can't provide everything a classroom does. But you can feel great knowing that you are providing everything your child needs. You can understand that it's not all about expensive materials and that you can easily adapt the Montessori method for your budget. And you'll understand the reason behind the activities so that you can be confident in presenting them to your child, knowing that you're following your child's leads and giving your child what he or she needs. You'll be encouraging a lifelong learner a lifelong love of learning, <clears throat> which is the key element of successful people. And finally, workshop four is troubleshooting, what to do when it's not working. So um, this will help you pinpoint the problems. And we know that sometimes everything is going great, but then something goes wrong and you don't know how to fix it. So in this workshop, we tackle the most common problems and we'll give you ways to fix them or better still avoid them. For example, how to handle younger siblings so that your kids can learn and develop at their own pace or how to praise your child so that he or she becomes a confident learner and not a narcissistic horror. Yeah, that's a that's another thing that parents really have to learn and, and change from how we were raised. Um, not, not that we're all raised as narcissistic horrors, but there's <laughs> a different way to encourage your child. Um, how to support your child who is at Montessori school so that you're not undoing the good work that um, is done at school and instead you're supplementing what he or she is learning the right way. Um, I think a lot of Montessori teachers get frustrated with this because parents end up undoing what the kids are learning at school because they don't understand the whole philosophy properly. Right, there's so much you can do to support your child who's in a Montessori school by having your home set up in a Montessori friendly way and following Montessori principles even if you don't have anything that looks like a Montessori material. And how to stay consistent with implementing Montessori and creating activities by understanding how easy it is to put the activity together and how to use your toys that your child already knows, but in a Montessori way. And what to do when your child doesn't complete the activity or misses, misuses the equipment so that you can nip any issues in the bud before they become bigger problems. And you'll be able to spot the telltale signs for those. And how to deal with family members who don't get it so that you're all on the same page with your child's best interest at heart. This is very common, especially with grandparents that just, you know, can't get their head around the concept, you know, because they, they were raised differently and they often raise their own children differently, not in the Montessori way. And how to start with an older child. So if you've only just discovered Montessori, you don't have a baby, but you want to do Montessori with your child now, who is perhaps at school age, it's not too late and you can still change your home into a Montessori environment so he or she can still reap the benefits of Montessori and will carry that with them as they go through adult life. Especially the concept of following your child, that's something that you can develop the habit of doing and the concept of communicating, listening to your child, those will all have you know, such important 
results with even a child who starts at a later age. And we've got some bonuses and this one is, I think this is the most important thing of the whole course actually is. I do too. <laughs> the Facebook group where me and Deb pop in every day and we answer your questions. Um, so anything that comes up, whether you're struggling actually putting activities together or you're trying to follow the child and you're not really sure what they need, um, you just come in and ask us and we will help you um, provide your child with what they actually need. And it's a really nice group, um, not just me and Deb, we've got other people in there that will, you know, help you out as well. They'll yes. uh, their advice or their tips. Or if people yeah. find things, you know, sometimes you find a, a really good resource, people share that as well. So it's, it's a great group to, to be in. Yeah, it's a wonderfully supportive community and, and it's fun to see, you know, how the, how the parents encourage each other and, and, and they come up with things, that, tell them things that, that they had problems with with their kids, you know, to, you know, give, to empathize with them and often tell them what worked for them, how they got past a problem. So, so you have both Joe's advice, my advice and the advice of the other people in the group. And we've also got hand-picked resources that we know will help you get started quickly and easily. So this will take save you a load of time and energy and money. Um, it'll keep you focused and it's designed so you'll get results quickly without you know hours and hours of work. And now we've got the PDF bundles. So there's a Montessori shopping list. This is not a shopping list for Montessori specific equipment it's a shopping list for things that you could pick up in thrift stores or you know the dollar shop or whatever or things that you've maybe already got around your own home uh, what to look out for and you know things that you can pick up cheaply a um, montessori quote book a resources guide um, how to set up a snack station the scope and sequence and further reading and this includes links for free copies of montessori's own work And we also have the PDF workbooks for each section. So this will help you pinpoint problem areas and guide you to where you most need it. And the workshops are pre-recorded. We ran them live last year. So the recordings of last year's um, training. And they're presented in video or audio and you get the PDF slides as well. So what you actually get is the four training sessions, which valued at $497, exclusive Facebook private access to me and Deb, um, handpicked resources that will help you get started quickly and easily, a PDF bundle, um, plus your video, audio, PDF of each session, and often we have other things that we throw in unexpectedly when we put them together. So the value is $3,497, which we know is a lot of money. And one of the key things that we set out when we decided to put this course together was to make it super affordable for everyone. So it's a one-time investment of $97. So if you want to join us, pop over to crashcourse27.com. Um, you can invest using PayPal or credit cards um, and it will take you through the process. And if you are joining up, let us know in the chat box so we can welcome you into the course. So, um, we know that you just want to get started and you can do that today. You can just go and get started, click through. Um, you don't want to miss out on giving your child the foundation and the Montessori education that you believe is right for them. And that's why we've crammed all the important information into a crash course so that you can like cut through the overload and just get started. So this is um, a few things that 
previous participants have said, we've had over 200 people go through the course so far. So Jessica says, a big thank you to both Deb and Joe for taking the time to create this programme. I know it'll make a big difference in our family and I'm excited to see how our three-year-old daughter is responding so well to the few activities I've put together for her so far. And Kimo says, Montessori for me is a bit overwhelming, but the course didn't feel that way. The freedom to go back and watch when I really had time to focus was great. I enjoyed the personal feel of the information because it didn't feel like we were being taught by strangers. And Carolyn says, before the course, I was confused by the many images on Pinterest and Facebook. I was intrigued by the wonderful appearance of children being so engaged and capable in the pictures. I wondered how teachers got to that level. I tried some Montessori activities with young children at home and didn't realize how much more was possible. I didn't understand the meaning of the Montessori approach. <clears throat> so not only um, Montessori is great, but there's also a lot of knock-on effects from Montessori. So you'll find that having a Montessori child at home is a more thoughtful, kind, considerate and helpful child. And that has a knock-on effect of cutting down on fights and arguments and family bickering. Yeah, I wanted to mention here that one of my, one, some of the research that I used in my dissertation um, was about Montessori studies that they'd done. Actually, it was in a Montessori public school, and they found that the children who were in the Montessori classrooms were, showed a difference on the playground, that they were more thoughtful and considerate and helpful than the, the other children were. Yeah, it's interesting, interesting knock-on effects that I don't think many people talk about usually. Um, also, your home will become calmer and a more pleasant place to be as your child learns to tidy up after him or herself, putting away toys and helping with jobs such as the laundry. This is, I think this is a really big one because I hear so many parents complaining about their kids not tidying up. And because I started Montessori when uh, my son was a baby, he just got into the habit of tidying and putting things away straight away when he's finished using them. So My, ch my children did too. Yeah, we've never had that problem. You know, very rarely I have to tell him to tidy his bedroom. It's yeah, my children are much better at organizing things than I am. <laughs> so growing up that way was very helpful, but they are amazing in the ability they have to organize things and keep things clean. And your child will feel much calmer, and so will you. So um, when you're living in chaos, your mind and body feels chaotic. So if you change your environment to a calm place, your mind and body follows. And this, again, is something that I feel is very true, that my son, although he's very energetic and sporty, he's also very kind of calm as a person. Yeah, I would say that's true for both my children and my granddaughter too, yeah. So a quick recap. In the crash course, you'll get the four pre-recorded workshops with Deb and I, um, the hand-picked resources that help you get started quickly and easily, the Montessori PDF resource bundles and the interactive private members group to ask your questions and get support. So a few frequently asked questions. Can I access the workshops at any time? Yes, they're recorded, they're in a members area so you can go in when it's convenient for you. So we know that um, most of our students are moms there are, we've actually got an aunt and a grandma in there as well and we've got some dads but we've also got people all over the world so we wanted it to be accessible at any time anywhere so anyone can just go in and work through it at their own pace will i be a certified teacher at the end of the program this is a no so this is a quick start program it's aimed for parents who want to get started quickly on their Montessori journey. It's not a teaching program. You won't be certified, you won't be a teacher at the end. It would be a good course to do if you're thinking of doing the Montessori training, but you're not 100% sure. 
and it would give you a really good foundation for your training later on but it's not a certified teaching training course so the course is really good for parents that want to get started quickly um, anyone who's been trying to use Montessori at home but is struggling, maybe it hasn't been working and you don't know why, or parents of children that are in Montessori school and you want to support them at home. So what age is the course aimed at? Well, because we're showing you the concepts beside, behind Montessori and how to apply them, your child's age isn't really that significant. And most of our current members have babies to lower elementary, so probably the under 10 crowd. But like I said, we have a grandma and we've got an aunt taking the course as well. So who's the programme not for? It's not for fully qualified Montessori teachers. You will know everything that we're going to go through. Um, it's not for parents who are not interested in setting up their home the Montessori way to help their children become independent and happy learners. It's not for those who expect everything handed on a plate. We show you what you need to do so you can implement it as you follow your child. And it's not for anyone looking for Montessori qualifications to teach at a school. And this is what Caroline had to say. Um, the biggest relief for me was the balance between what we needed to set up and do and what our daughter does at school. This released the pressure to have to teach her instead of focus on practical life activities and being able to help have her imaginative play. I also learned a lot about how to set up our spaces at home, make them more suitable for her development, practical life, also in terms of not overwhelming her, how to separate present materials and toys to her. So, that is the Montessori crash course. You've got the link if you want to sign up. Do let us know if you're going to sign up in the chat box. And if you've got any questions, I can see there's a few in there. So, any other questions about either the course or Montessori in general, anything you want, um, put them in the question box. So, um, let's see. Brandy said, what materials do you recommend investing in that children can use through most of their education? So this is maybe the, like the key pieces of Montessori equipment if you're going to invest, what would you invest in? Okay, I think some of, some of the sensorial materials are amazing and the versatility, like the three basic materials, if a parent, if a person is going to be homeschooling, I recommend that they for sure have the pink tower, the brown stair, and the red rods. And the reason is that they're wonderful, they're just beautiful materials and help children develop that love of, of the materials and, and the desire to take care of them. But they have so many extensions, they're just amazing things, even elementary age kids can do with them. And I also like, like the binomial and trinomial cubes, those can be used for algebra later on. So those would be great. Things like the um, metal insets are very useful for a number of years, although they wouldn't be used as much by older children, although they could actually do a number of you know, creative art activities with them. But I do find I actually have some plastic insets from Ellison's Montessori that I really like because they don't take up much space, and that's something to look at too. So I've, I've reviewed a lot of different Montessori materials and written posts on what I recommend children have. The golden bead materials are fabulous if you're going to be using Montessori as a home, as part of your home school. And of course, the sandpaper letters have a limited life, actually. I mean, as far as ages, but they're, it's very, very helpful to have some sort of tactile letters for your child when your child's a preschooler. And it doesn't have to be sandpaper. Some people have, have made their own felt or felt, you know, velvet, all sorts of different sorts of things, even glitter glue. There are lots of different things you can do to have some sort of tactile letters. And some children prefer other types of sensations to the sandpaper anyway. 
and as I said, that that is a bit more limited, but it's very important when your child is starting out that they have the tactile letters and numbers. Yeah, I made ours with um, sticky backed felt rather than mm -hmm. paper. I've got a tutorial up on the, the website if anyone needs it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a roundup of tutorials for most of, most of the early Montessori materials. Yeah, and I think, yeah, the pink tower and the brown stair and the red rods were really popular. Um, one thing I wish I hadn't bought was the number rods. Right. We didn't really need those. He, he didn't really use them. It was so... Uh, right, I've seen people, you, children use Duplo rods to make number rods, and number rods are, are not something I would purchase for homeschool just because the red rods are important. And after that, they usually can figure it out with some sort of, like there are even ones that you can print out now. I know Montessori Print Shop has some free red rod printables that you can use to do the same concept. And for homeschool, I think that's really the way to go. And um, yeah, the metal insets, my son loved those and the, um both the nobbled and nobbless cylinders, but I don't think you really need to buy both. We have both, and you really right. need yeah. them. But yeah, they are, they are very nice. There are a lot of extensions you can do with the nobbless cylinders, and you can add those to the pink tower, bronze stair, and red rods. So those can be used for a long time, too. They're used together. Okay, there's no name on this one, but it said, I've tried presenting the pink tower, but my daughter won't build it properly. And sometimes she just builds it up and then knocks it down. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> That's an activity that really has to be shown in a very exact manner, very, very slowly. And, and for your daughter to understand that it's different from a normal tower. Most towers, they build them up and knock them down, but this is one that you build it very slowly and very carefully and then take it down each part and and generally if a child you know does just knock it down i'll say well we'll need to put it away and and, and use it another day because you know, this this these materials have to be treated very very gently so it's gradually with something like that i'll usually just present it again at another time and always make sure that i really exaggerate the the motions and the gentleness and the slowness of the, of the presentation. And, and for them to realize that it's a different type of tower from the other types that they're used to. And, and you know, I can even say for most towers, it's fine to knock them down, but this is a very special one that we don't knock down. Um, <clears throat> okay, another one. I haven't got names on most of these. Um, my, pro my son has problems holding a pencil. He gets frustrated. Is there some Montessori activities I can do to help him? Typically, most of the practical life activities are designed to help develop the strength they need for writing. And then also things like the metal insets are developing the, the muscular control they need for writing. And the activities with the knobs, even the, the knob cylinders are developing that the grip that they need. Um, if they need a specific trick, I have a <laughs> reading and writing activities Pinterest board that does have some specific tricks that you can use with children who do have difficulty learning how to hold a pencil, even after they've done exercises to develop their pencil grip. But, uh, but many of the preliminary activities just will automatically develop it. We had some... Um they're called rock crayons. They're crayons in a funny little kind of rock shape, but they force the child to hold it in that pincer mode so mm -hmm. they can draw. And I think that helps as well, you know, strengthening the muscles. Right. So if the child's getting frustrated with holding a proper crayon or pencil, then this way they can still do the creative stuff, but it's also working those muscles, which will help them hold the pencil in the long run. So they, they are, they're made from soy. I'm sure they're called rock crayons. Um, 
see what else. <clears throat> This question um, kind of just touched on it. I see a lot of Montessori puzzles that have little knobs on them. Are they necessary? I think the, the knobs are very helpful just for that for that specific reason is to develop the pincer grip that they need for, for writing. So many of the Montessori materials will have little knobs and, and we often do use puzzles that have the knobs. Um, there's another one here, um, Susie says, I'm raising my child to be bilingual. What should I do with the, the language materials? Should I have one for each language? I'll let you answer that one, Joe. You have had the most experience with that. <laughs> um, so I very much followed the child and my son, although we live in Japan, and I'm English. English was really his first language. My Japanese isn't great. I've only ever spoken English to him. And we use English as the home language. And then um, he got very interested in letters quite early on. When he was about 20 months, he started showing an interest in English letters. So I gave him what he needed in English. And then the Japanese, um, we actually just bought some wipeable cards, Kumon cards for the hiragana. And he kind of taught himself those. Um, katakana, so in Japanese, there's three different kind of alphabets. There's hiragana, which they learn first, katakana, which is used for foreign words, and the kanji, which is like the Chinese symbols. The katakana, one day we were in a cafe and he just started reading the menu and I was like, how did you know how to read that? And he said, oh, I don't know, it's just in my head. So I don't even know how he learned katakana, he just did. And the kanji is kind of picked up as he's gone along. So I didn't have any specific learning materials in Japanese apart from the wipeable um, cards for learning the, the hiragana. Um, I know some people have separate shelves, especially if they're homeschooling. So my son actually went to kindergarten, a Japanese kindergarten. It was not a Montessori kindergarten, but a lot of their philosophies were in line with Montessori. But if you are homeschooling, I know some people have separate shelves. So they have, um, you know, like the three-part cards, they'll have them, say, in Spanish, and then they'll have the English version as well. So the child's learning both or they'll colour coordinate things. So maybe um, all the English things are in blue and all the Spanish things are in red, something like that. So there's different ways about it really. Um, I think just following the child. I think if you follow the child, you can't go wrong. Um, and having lots of books, we've got books in both languages, all kinds of subjects, not just story books, but you know, like reference books and things as well. And one of my son's favourite books from when he was when he was three, I used to go to Japanese class, and there was a kids' encyclopedia, and he loved that book. It was meant for elementary kids, and that's all he asked for for Christmas was this Japanese encyclopedia. So that's what he got, and he still loves the book. So you know, if it, it wasn't really suitable age-wise, but that's what he wanted, so that's what we got him, and. You know, he loves it, so follow the child and you'll be okay. Have you got anything to add? Do your children speak a second language? Um, no, mine don't. I always introduced some Spanish and French, but we weren't bilingual. Right, I think that is it for the questions. I can't see any others. If you've got any more questions, pop them in the box now, otherwise you'll miss out. You can always email Deb or I if you've got questions about the crash course or anything. Right, so we'll wrap up there because we've been on for an hour and a half, kind of overrun. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we know it's taking a big chunk of your time and we really appreciate you uh, coming today.
Have you got any last words, Deb? Yeah, we just we would love to see you in the crash course and see you in the Facebook group. It's always fun to to have um, new parents there who are interested in finding out how they can best help their children. Right. Well, thank you again. And if you popped on late and you missed the first bit or you had to leave early or whatever, the replay will be up. I'll send out the, the link for that. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Bye.